Colonel Commissar Ibram Gaunt, I have a reputation, modile, a reputation as a fair, honest man who treats his soldiers well and supports them in the face of darkness. Potentially, that reputation makes me soft. It seems I understand failure and forgive it. Some, like Cowell, believe me to be a weak commissar. Not prepared to take the action my rank demands. Not prepared to enforce field discipline where I see it failing. I am an imperial commissar. I will inflame the weak, support the wavering, guide the lost. I will be all things to all men who need me. But I will also punish without hesitation the weak, the incompetent, and the treasonous. Colonel Commissar Ibram Gaunt, Warhammer 40,000, Gaunt's Ghosts, the grim duck sharp to Kane's Flashman, stars in the series of books written by the godlike author Dan Abnett about the Tanith first, and only, regiment. Nobody knows why he shares his last name with a species of Tyranid. Perhaps he is so goddamn badass that he fought a Hormagorn three seconds after he was born, tore it in half, and wore its head as a hat. This is a distinct possibility. Perhaps one of the best characters in the 40k fluff because he acts like a decent person trying his hardest in the bleakest setting possible and not losing hold of his morals or conviction. Lesser authors in the Black Library wish they could make such a well-rounded and kick-ass character like Gaunt for their books. Origins of the Tanith first, and only, after Tanith was selected by the War Master to create three new regiments, the planet was plunged into a party the likes of which none, save Slanesh, had ever seen before. The massive party was noticed by a wandering Chaos fleet, whose ass was recently kicked. Angry, the Chaos Armada destroyed most of the planet. Ibram Gaunt then had to make a painful decision. He would take what forces were available and leave the planet, allowing the destruction of Tanith. His troops at first didn't understand why he did this, and resented him for it. Eventually, they forgave him. Okay, no not really. Current status upon being declared lost in the war. Gaunt was posthumously promoted to the rank of Lord General and given full military honors. When he showed up after making a 10 year leap into the future from a botched warp translation, he was given his promotion and ascended to the Sabbat Crusade's high command. In the wake of a crisis of confidence in War Master Macrath's leadership, Gaunt was further promoted to First Lord Executor, essentially Macrath's second in command and de facto heir should the War Master be slain, which is really possible, mind you, given his emaciated Hikikomori state. Post Gathering Storm, Gaunt is apparently well known enough to be mentioned with the same level of familiarity as Yarrick and Macharius. Items of significant importance One of the Tanith Guardsmen named Gaunt tries to kill Gaunt many times. The first time, Gaunt goes his ass when there's a demo charge about to go off, and instead of leaving him there or balamind his ass he risks his life to carry him out. Also of note is the fact that later on becomes the de facto second in command and takes over field command while Gaunt goes on a short vacation with the friendly neighborhood torturers. Gaunt is one of the only men ever to achieve the rank of Colonel Commissar giving him epic status. However, his mentor was mentioned to be General Commissar, making even more epic actually. He was Commissar General, which means he was general within the commissariat. Colonel Commissar means he is both Imperial Guard Colonel and Commissar at once. To further elevate his awesomeness he found an STC that was intact but had to be destroyed because it was tainted by chaos, mythophagos. Everything was alright though, given it was heretical tech to begin with. Gaunt's favorite weapon is a power sword that can slice through anything Gaunt kills tanks with it and even cut down a chaos space marine single handed. Yeah it was a surprise attack but still. The weapon is the heirloom sword of Hiranimo Sonda, the original leader, or one of them, of Vervenhive. The sword is of antique design and probably hails from when the emperor walked around, therefore it deserves its awesome status. He also has an old bolt pistol that always seems to be running out of ammo, but it's okay because then he just switches to his power sword Gaunt's trademark item as a Tanith Camo cloak which he made himself to better lead his regiment of Scottish ninja assassins, making him the only commissar ever capable of infiltration. Actually not only, since Lord Commissar's in Codex, it can also take stealth punts, 
but the only named. He also loves to charge enemies firing double bolt pistols, and fight multiple chaos marines at once with nothing but his power sword. He can do this because Gaunt is almost as bad as the Scythe as Kane is, Kane having taken on the same with a chainsword and flashlight pistol, but he certainly hates the experiences like this. Gaunt led a unit that killed a giant battleship pyramid tank commanded by Hera Tarasfidel, one of the supreme generals leading chaos forces during the crusade, that would have given most titans a run for their money, before setting off to destroy said giant battleship pyramid tank. His daughter's bodyguard got herself shot running straight at a sniper with no armor so maybe it's a good thing she's not around to teach anyone her bad habits. Pretty sure this guy was thinking about different books and events as if they happened at the same time. Actually happened over a decade apart. Charging the tank happened during the siege of Evenhive whereas the bodyguard doesn't die until war master. In fact, his daughter hadn't even been born when the prior event happened when all the senior Vervenhive commanders were killed. Gaunt was the only ranking military officer left alive to coordinate the defense of an entire hive city under siege by chaos forces on all sides. For many commanders, this task would be flaming pants on head overwhelming, to say the least. But Gaunt just sighs and resigns himself to spend the rest of the day calling out orders, reorganizing thousands of demoralized soldiers and shattered armor over the Vox, and effectively holding off an entire chaos army. We get a glimpse of the strategist that Gaunt could be if command ever gave him the time of day. After the battle, do Gaunt and company get medals of honor and gold statues a day named after him a fucking commemorative plaque no not a single fucking medal was given that day but he did get the girl though right in the command center no less of course not they were doing their job you don't get medal for that well at least in the imperial guard you don't Although the Hivers literally build a statue to the Tanith men, the architect states the statue has nothing to do with Gaunt, whom he never even spoke to. He's also called the people's hero. So you know, the Tanith are allowed to absorb the remaining Vervan Hivers to reinforce their dwindling ranks. And Gaunt's ghost are again rushed off to yet another battlefield. Gaunt has never had to balam his own troops, though he tried to on X Cardinal before his chief medical officer talked him down. He has, on several different occasions, blamed troops of other units, including for stealing vital medical supplies. Do note that even Kane had on occasion blamed his own soldiers, although for nothing less than outright treason. Two three four different inquisitors have tried taking Gaunt on. One ended up min fucked and the other was kidnapped recruited by the elder. The third turned out to be a Xeno specialist of some kind and the last ultimately allied with him. Gaunt has carried more wounded Imperial Guard troops off the field of battle than a medevac Valkyrie, and he's a commissar. Enough said. Gaunt and company were stranded on a chaos-held world for a sizable stretch of time. Gaunt and company returned to the Imperium and tainted, apparently simply telling the insidious cancer of chaos to fuck off actually works. As long as you are Colonel Commissar Ibram fucking Gaunt. Gaunt and company are the favored regiment and have acted as the honor guard of a reborn living saint. It's like fucking having an angel as a best friend in real life Gaunt's eyes were seared off by cultists when he was captured once. The aswipe battle group general who sent him and his men on the mission that lead to this felt so guilty that he paid the best Tetchmaju to give Gaunt bionic eyes, which look like regular eyes but now allow him to see into the infrared spectrum. Yes, he can stealth infiltrate, he has a blade, and a high tech range weapon, bolt pistol, fuck. Yeah. Gaunt was an HQ choice in 4th edition, making his men fearless, and thus not being the big, bad, executing type. His metal mini can still be found on the Games Workshop website, or eBay, as well as a smattering of other characters from the Tanith first, by taking all accounts in all the novels to be true. He has cut down enough chaos-loving cultists to fill several armies several times over. Seriously the body count done by this man is insane. Con would buy him a drink and ask him to join his homies if he could. Lord Militant Ibram Gaunt First Lord Executor Ibram Gaunt Regimental Commissar Anton Jebert Anton Jebert was the sidekick Balamai 
will execute the governor when he fails second in command to governor militant Lucas Alexander in the video game of Dawn of War. Dark Crusade until some space marine kleptomaniacs purge them when Relic and THQ made a risk s campaign that would have been unbalanced if the Imperial Guard and space marines were on the same side for not leaving Cronus when Captain Davian Cool ordered them to. His overall description says that while his job as second in command to Alexander is to help maintain the loyalty of his troops, with emphasis on the 5th company which dons the colors of the 85th Cadian upon rebelling. He, along with the two Vindicare assassins gained from conquering provinces, has a contingency order akin to Order 66. Star Wars reference yay. Balam references to a universe where Xenos not demonized his heresy to execute Governor Alexander if he were to not prove expeditious and valorous enough in the Emperor's service. Unlike the two Vindicare assassins. He would get to replace him and take command, though since Alexander proved himself and regimental commissar Jebet was killed by the Blood Ravens, that didn't happen. He didn't really advise much to Alexander the way his unnamed predecessor and Doran Farrier from Soulstorm did to their respective generals, letting some no-name guardsmen do that for him. He was voiced by Richard Newman, who also voiced the commissar who aided General Stern from Winter Assault as well as that of M. Bison from the animated Street Fighter. I'm talking about the one that was known for wanting to see some Street Fighters deliciously pummel to dust, and shouting yes a few times afterwards. Alphas came. Courage is not the lack of fear but the ability to face it. Lieutenant John B. Putnam Jr. I know he's a good general, but is he lucky Napoleon Bonaparte C.C. Cyphus Kane hero of the Imperium succinct summary of the Commissar's whole career. Scream of unending imposter syndrome. Also a succinct summary of the Commissar's whole career well. I'm afraid it'll have to wait. Whatever it was. I'm sure it was better than my plan to get out of this by pretending to be mad. I mean, who would have noticed another madman round here Black Adder Cyphus Kane. Hero of the Imperium was a famous commissar of the Imperium and is the protagonist of the eponymous series of novels by Sandy Mitchell, the grimdark flashman to Gaunt Sharp. He spent most of his career in active service attached to Imperial Guard regiments from the ice world of Valhalla, most notably the 597th and accompanied by his aide Yudin, he retired to become a professor and a scholar progenium later in life, but this did not mark the end of his exploits, being recalled into active service during the 13th Black Crusade. He was also called upon at many points throughout his life to assist the Ordos Xenos Inquisitor Amberly Vale, who is almost certainly his lover. The novels are presented as extracts from Kane's personal, unofficial memoirs, edited by Amberly. Published only to be kept under lock and key by the Inquisition as they present a vastly different story to all the official Imperial propaganda about his adventures, including his own far more self-aggrandizing and less candid public memoirs. Contrary to the heroic image he cultivated to the Imperium at large, Kane described himself as a self-serving coward in his memoirs, spending most of his time trying to ensure his own comfort and survival, only becoming a hero by accident. However, despite his self-deprecation, he routinely demonstrates great bravery and compassion in the stories, leading many to believe he is a much better person than he would admit to himself. The debate on Kane's character is a hot topic for readers, both in the Inquisition and real life. Some say he really was a coward, others say he really was a depreciating hero. Then there are those who think he started out a coward, then developed into an actual hero as the stories progressed. Which one is the truth not even his author knows. He always subscribed to the long term version of cowardice often taking courses of action that appeared extremely dangerous on the basis that they gave him a better chance of survival in the long term, if not the short one. For example, he once charged a hive tyrant on foot and fought it in close combat with just a chain sword because he knew he would live longer fighting it than he would running from it. This is most illustrated in his dealings with chaos from which a broad cane doctrine can be extrapolated as thus, it is safer to blindly disrupt the enemy's activities now, than to wait to find out what the enemy's plan actually is. Kane will do almost anything to survive, almost, because despite his self-professed selfishness, 
He has a peculiar habit of not sacrificing people who don't need to die even when not giving a shit about them would make things easier for him. He'll run down almost any course of action that will let him survive for even a second longer. And if he really, really can't do anything else he'll die fighting, taking whatever is trying to kill him with him. He is also well known for being one of the few commissars to earn the trust and respect of the guardsmen he served with, aided by his heroic reputation, but mainly because he persistently demonstrated care and concern for the soldiers of his regiment. Despite repeated insistence in his memoirs he merely did this to get on their good sides and avoid friendly fire incidents. There's a great deal of evidence that his feelings were genuine. While his character was in question, his competency was not, which is one reason he became legendary in the first place. Kane himself was an extremely skilled combatant, being an excellent shot with his trusty Les pistol, not a bolt pistol, as all the cover arts are propaganda pieces, and highly proficient in the use of his chainsword in melee. Amongst other things, he defeated an orc warbus and stood up to two chaos space marines in single combat. In fairness, the first time was just him parrying the fuck out of his chain axe with his chainsword until Yugen could melt him, and the second said marine was halfway to dead after berserking through a compound of slanishy cultists, but still, both incredible feats for an ordinary man, especially as the only bionics he possessed were a few replacement fingers, and good ones at that, custom built by a tech marine, not to mention going toe to toe with two tyrannid hive tyrants and wounding them both before his men could help him. Mind you, even ranged hive tyrants can rip apart an assault marine and eat him without too much effort. He's generally believed to be the best swordsman in his entire segmentum. Further exploits include holding his own against a fucking demon princess pretty well, with Jürgen's help, but still he did better than most would have, defeating Jenna Steelers in close combat, one of which could kill two word bearers and severely injure a third in a matter of seconds and standing his ground against a fucking Jenna Steeler Patriarch Broodlord. He also has the honor of being forever listed on active battle duty, according to official records, despite death by old age and being buried with full battle honors in the early M42s presumably during the Indomitus Crusade. This is because, in the course of his exploits, he had been assumed to have died only to reappear later so many times that the Administratum couldn't keep up with the paperwork and simply issued a general order that his recorded status not be changed despite any evidence apparently to the contrary. Of course, his legacy is such that saying he's still in service to the Imperium wouldn't quite be wrong. The novels, essentially, George MacDonald phrases the Flashman papers and McCausland stories sprinkled with a bit of black adder and transplanted into the 41st millennium. Though, while Kane is more of a coward with a heart of gold, Flashman can best be described as a jerk with a heart of jerk. Braised in a Jamaican jerk sauce, then dried out into jerk jerk jerky and served with a side order of colonial racism. Kane is also infamous for being one of the more promiscuous characters in 40k. His list of conquests include a smoking hot inquisitor, his current probably last lover, a busty governor's daughter, a surprisingly attractive young tech priestess, not confirmed, but likely and wouldn't be surprising, and various other women throughout the series. The first book has Kane nearly put the moves on his regiment's female colonel when the two attended an imperial governor's party, with good chance of success, only stopping because he thought it would be better to keep it professional, and surprisingly this has led to multiple attempts by the forces of Slanesh to corrupt Kane, all of which ended in miserable failure. Whilst the books are quite well written, Sandy Mitchell is a big fan of recycling, even down to specific sentences. Hence each book is guaranteed to feature exactly the same descriptions of his aid Jürgen as all the others. Someone doing something with almost indecent haste, and about half a dozen variations on the theme. Of course, if I knew what I was getting myself into by doing X, I'd have rather Y usually involving charged into the eye of terror with nothing but a rusty fork. To be fair, this is very much a comedy trope. They are also notable for the Yugen X Melter, where most of the dramatic fights are ended by the intervention of Kane's aid Yugen armed with a Meltigan and his powers as a sicker disrupting blank. Over the course of the series, 
Jurgen has racked up more kills than the rest of the Valhalla 597th put together, and has yet to have any character development whatsoever, but that's fine, because Jurgen is 125% distilled awesome. While it's unclear if this is an issue with Kane or Mitchell, the books also can't seem to tell the difference between a heavy bolter and a storm bolter, using the terms interchangeably to the point where it can sometimes be difficult to figure out which particular weapon is actually being described, at least there's a good chance it's one of Kane's own writing flaws, and at least he's not confusing land raiders with razorbacks. Also features psychotic lesbian Valhallans, orky gargans crumpin dos necron gits, a grinning, friendly neighborhood inquisitor, who you should flee from at all costs, psychotic sickers who wear dresses too small, savants that are barred from entering casinos, world eaters getting killed by mere humans, surviving a starship crash, playing space hulk for real, blue fassa painted TAU supporters yelling that you can take their lives, but not their freedom, and the harriers getting the goddamn cup, except they didn't, space demon werewolf sicker Hitler being kicked over a dam by a solid boot to the arse, and an avatar of Kane being dynamic entried from a starship right onto a greater demon, the books are chock full of puns and references, some of the best are listed below, if it bleeds we can kill it, sanitize the site from orbit, it's the only way to be sure that would be an ecumenical matter popular hello from a judge foreboding Thomas Beige, Tom Brown from the Flashman papers, I suppose anything that might look a bit eldery eldery she repeated, as though it just might make sense if she heard it often enough, is that even a word, trivia, he is essentially the Edmund Blackadder of the Warhammer 40k universe, more specifically, he is the Captain Edmund Blackadder of Blackadder goes forth for Warhammer 40k universe, like Captain Blackadder, he is always trying to avoid combat, escape death, and retire from the Imperial Guard. Jürgen can be considered as Kane's Balric dirty, disregarded, not all that bright but a good dog's body to Kane, though a slightly more intelligent and significantly more badass Baldric. Think a cross between Baldric from series 1 and the later Baldrics, but with a Meltigan. Also, Kane respects Jürgen. Alternately, he is the Sir Harry Paget Flashman, VCKCB of the Flashman series of novels for the Warhammer 40k universe. Flashman was a key inspiration for Edmund Blackadder, although not of the first series, that was different. Seriously, look those books up, they're fantastic, racist and sexist as hell, it's satire, but pretty prolific for more sensitive readers but fantastic. Jürgen can be thought of as Fraser's other classic character Private Nick Orslan, J. Second Gordon Highlanders, dirtiest soldier in the world, the Tartan Caliban and the Highland Division's answer to Peking Man. Think Pigpen in a kilt. Jürgen, however, appears to be smarter and has a Bristolian rather than a Glaswegian accent, which makes him sound inbred as hell, which might explain his psychic blankness. According to the narrator of his books, no, really, he uses the Lord Commissar rules on the tabletop, but this has become impossible in 8th edition since Lord Commissars, and normal Commissars, cannot wield chains wards or this pistols. Also, Kane wasn't a fan of the Lord Commissar honorific even though he himself was entitled to use it. Kane was so awesome that for decades he was the only entity in the galaxy to slip past Games Workshop's chrono barrier on moving the setting into the 42nd millennium. Then Gathering Storm happened, but then it cheated by saying no one knew what the real year was anyway. He is permanently marked as being on active duty because of the number of times he was believed to be dead only to come back from Emperor knows where. Notably this was not rescinded even when confirmed dead and buried in front of thousands as a war hero. He is just that awesome, to be fair to the Imperials. This hasn't stopped people in the past. A pretty good fanfic called Tales from the Black Millennium has Edmund Blackadder in command of an Imperial Guard regiment. It's sadly in Finnish sequel more Tales from the Black Millennium drags Sylphus Kane into the mix. There is a small section of the Talon Desert Raiders that think he is a prophet of the Emperor, 
which is at the same time hilarious considering Kane's personality and perfectly understandable after a couple of them seeing Kane challenge a world eater and prevail over a demon princess the entire thing is the result of Ems himself trolling one of Kane's old classmates, Beach, who hates Kane but is stuck in the same unit as the Kane worshipping Talon. So I don't know if you know this, but we've got a website with lots of models. And whenever I say lots of models, I mean lots of models. We've got models for any setting that you can think of. With humans with biddies, animals that shouldn't have biddies but do have biddies, dwarves and elves with biddies. Look, we've got a lot of smut models. But it doesn't stop there. We really do have models for anything and everything. And to be honest, they look so good. Chef's kiss, so good. But it's not all smart for all you good Christian Minecraft server players. We've got you covered. And we even got the weebs covered too, which is unusual for this channel because we don't <laughs> like weebs. <laughs> yeah, the weebs aren't that bad. Are they? We, also, just that bad. <laughs> we also have 5th edition subclasses and adventures, which some of them are free for download. And we sell a physical printed copy of Steel Water as well. And you can request a signed version if that's your thing, where I'll draw a penis on it for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, hey, if you want you know, us to sign a couple you want, decks, that's we, what you we'll, want. We'll give you decks, okay, guys? That's, that's what anyway, you want. Anyway, if you enjoy what we do here, go ahead and check out the website. It helps us out so, so much. And we don't need to worry about our YouTube overlords striking down another one of our channels. Our website is also now available as an app on Android. Also, and the winner of the daily giveaway is this guy. Yay! Woo! <laughs> Look, <laughs> 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 like, anyway, uh, in for a chance to win, all you gotta do is like, subscribe, leave a comment down below, automatically entered in. And to claim the prize, you just send an email to neckbeardycontact at gmail.com. Let's get back to the video. Commissar Holt. Commissar Holt is a badass motherfucker who enjoys pimp slapping the shit out of stuck up imperial governors for stories of their ineptitude. He is originally from the Warhammer 40k computer game Final Liberation, which about only two people play. Commissar from Warhammer Epic 40,000. Final Liberation. You're gonna need the patch. Or get the updated version on good old games. Kane loves him. His other jobs include pirate and vampire overseer of werewolf slaves. The listed halt was notified of an impending orc wag heading for the imperial planet of the listed, and immediately diverted to the planet. With the help of an ultramarines detachment, Hull was able to establish a base on the planet for external reinforcements to land. Being pre-pre-wardian in their soonness, the ultramarines there led by Captain Agrippa expressed his gratitude for the commissar's rescue and even said that no living commissar holds no more respect. Holt being cool as cucumber salad simply dismisses Agrippa with a vaguely irritated that will be all. Agrippa, of course. This might imply that this has to be some time before any other badass commissar alive became badass. Or after they died, you know. He also managed, with the help of the commander general, Akayu, to get some cogboys to an unnoticed cargo bay and managed to summon a fucking warhound titan. At some point, those same cogboys would also uncover a fuck mothering warlord battle titan. Holt is more than willing to tell you you suck at liberating an imperial world. He'll do it quiet out back. Presumably near your Sturk or class portagen, reminding you he's served under two Lord Commanders in a single campaign before. If you collapse entirely, he takes command to salvage what he can end in a moment of deep menace. You'd rather just have the pistol in the face, obliquely indicates the next attempt will be led by someone else. The Imperial forces on Velistad, which Alt keeps in good order, include, in cutscenes, Titans, Mordians, Talon, the listed PDF, who are very Valhalla looking, and Ultramarines while in campaign he also can lead Catalchans and Attilans. With a bit of game file fiddling he can also call upon Imperial Knights. The Dasari he arm wrestled Commissar Yerik and won. Yerik got out of it only by sheer luck, though, when the Orcs appeared and kidnapped Yerik. However, Halt did not let this pass, and he proceeded to destroy 134 trucks. 200 squads of shooter boys, 15 knobs, a warbus, and a mech boy carrying a shock attack gun simply by giving them the slapped commissar halt look. Another, retarded, story about Holt is where the fuck he went, as he was leading 10 million conscripts into battle against chaos. 
The warp unexpectedly opened and demons started appearing. Not about to retreat, Hull charged into the demon horde, shooting them with his bolter and slicing them with his power sword. Suddenly, a demon prince appeared. Hull instantly squared it up and charged, cutting the foul demon in half. As he stood triumphantly, he tripped, while standing still, over a fallen guardsman and fell into the warp. There, he saw the most vile, unholy, and Mary Sue force in the warp, called a Drago. Holt has gladly executed numerous imperial governors for mistreating troops that would be far more suited dying for the emperor. His full name is Fenstrom Holt leading some fans to speculate that defenestration, historically the traditional Czech method of dismissing unpopular prime ministers, is his preferred method of execution. Actually that's a different Holt. Holt and Death Watch Fantasy Flight games once again proved they were the beddiest of companies, showing their collective raging hard on for Holt with a large number of, all new, quotes throughout the Death Watch gamma line. Collected below, space marines are men in the same way a knife is a piece of metal. Space marines are forged, not born. They are the finest weapons of the emperor's will. A finely crafted weapon is like a finely crafted battle plan. Both will serve you well. No one man, however exalted or base, is more important than the mission. I have watched massive titans striding the battlefield. I have seen entire armored divisions at war with the orc hordes. I have borne witness to the firepower of an orbital lance strike. Yet among all these, none compare to the effectiveness of the Adeptus Estates at war. No foe is more pernicious when dug in than the forces of the archenemy. All too often, the difference between victory and defeat lies with one man. The coward represents as great a threat as a traitor. The traitor at least stands by his convictions. Wrath and glory also carries on the tradition and give us his first name. Those men whose lives you spent with such cavalier disregard, those men were Imperial Guard. They were Munitorum property. They belonged to the Segmentum Command. They belonged to the Emperor. Commissar Fenstrom Holt. Actually, that's a different Holt. Check page 27 of Eagle Ordinary. Uncivil disagreement. 1. The above quote also proves that the writers of Wrath and Glory are continuing the FFG tradition of slipping fanworks into 40k canon. Commissar Lord Burn, you die on my command. Not before Lord Commissar Burn while reviving Lord General Castor himself there is always that one character that is the quiet one. Not that he never talks, but he does so very rarely, never in cutscenes, and the few lines he has are absolute manly. Commissar Lord Burn accompanied Adrastia, Castor and Merrick during the events of Retribution, and surprisingly, stayed mostly quiet throughout the whole matter. Even though the crazy Mathefica faced a land raider, an avatar of Cain and a demon prince, he still kept his goddamned cool. Why because he talks only when he's with the troops, as it's part of his job, and not doing it correctly would be heresy. No, seriously, he thinks that if he talks at all, it'll draw too much attention to him and then to his scarred face. Poor old Burn lost some of his features. Throughout the countless battles he's been in and he's always been quite self-conscious about it. However, he only cares if other commanders see his face, get him on the field with regular guardsmen, and he'll let loose manly lines to inspire his soldiers like no tomorrow. He throws out far more inspiring quotes than any commissar should, like the epic drive me closer. I want to hit them with my sword, sure to get any chimera driver pumped up for what will undoubtedly be a one-sided slaughter. If you ever want a commissar by your side, you'll want commissar Lord Burn. Also, don't expect him to scratch an elder's ears. Burn Balam commissar Lord Burn will just punch the foul Xenos in the fucking face with a power fist. Quotes if this one must die to push the rest of you, so be it Balam I haven't given you leave to die, you coward, on your feet said when reviving commanders, yes, he can insult inspire a SN captain back to life, your wounds mean nothing stand said to Elenius Pius after Horus completely obliterated him, Pius got back up 5 seconds later, harder, better, faster, stronger faster, harder, meaner, better this is your last stand, no doubt, 
no fear of cripping a power fist not as striking as Yarrick's claw, but it will suffice. Follow my example or I will make you one. What task requires more that sword or blade the better to be seen? Do I have to die to prove my faith and fearlessness to you lot I trained for this day? Don't fear it. Just get clear no fear. Only victory their corpses will pave our way to victory their far series mine chaos lord. You're mine I'll teach their library and don't read it. Just click here drive me closer. I want to hit them with my sword. It's me versus a shred of their god guardsman shouldn't be scary by petty things such a giant flaming monster armed with a giant sword chaos exists to be slain in game unlike other commissars who can only motivate their men to fire a bit faster or keep up morale by popping ahead. Burn Balam Commissar Lord Urn can make them invincible, faster moving, able to hit like a truck full of trucks, and have this benefit apply to everyone on the screen. Oh and when fully upgraded the ability lasts longer than its cooldown time. This ability makes him the strongest hero in Retribution's campaign. The cheese is of such magnificence that the grind of all grinds that is the last mission in Retribution can be done in 11 minutes as your regulation force of invulnerable super fast and rapid firing catachins and melter stormies rush through the mission in a tide of blood and exploding bodies so massive that corn gets exited down under. And you can do it for the price of between 10 and 20 guardsmen, all righteously executed by Burn. Kyrus as a demon decided after watching Burn slaughter his forces while killing more of his own than the enemy could, to give up this demon thing because he'll never be that cornet. Or he can choose to lead through example, Yerik style, through special moves, balls of steel and sheer stubbornness. Allies are healed when he is hurt and they refuse to die by just being near his relic power fist. In fact, with the right war gear and surrounded by guardsmen, he can revive himself due to not wanting to give a bad example by dying just like that. Awesome. He can only equip upgrade his melee weapons. And in fact he's the only unaugmented human that uses a power fist in the game. If you want to punch demon prince Kiris in the face, he is your man. He can T upgrade his as pistol, but not that it matters, since it's already able to one shot terminators, so it's probably somewhere around strength D. App 1. Also it should be noted that if you execute a guardsman or other infantry unit, you get the resources to reinforce them again. Pair this with caster's ability to reinforce squads for free, and you have unlimited resources to drown the enemy and men. Trivia you can't just write Commissar Burn. Lord must be in all caps before it, or else it says you didn't write it at the beginning. Balam Heresy. That is, even angrier than Holt Slap Commissar Holt hears voiced by Keith Ferguson. Yep, the same one as Ronan, Plague Marines and many orcs. Heresy. He, like Adrascha and most high command, wears a badass greatcoat with a hat. Lord General Caster had to be given a DLC hat to not be left out. Meanwhile, Merrick wears his regulation bald head. Bendel and Patchen. His cosplay DLC is a Krieger gas mask, which is a headwear that he wears under his other hat. So, technically, double hat with epaulets, which may in fact make him as important as the Emperor. He has trained for that day. Yerik's bail I can kill a marine, but Burns can bring artillery stree Balam Commissar Balam Lord Balam Burn. Severa Lorraine. Severa Lorraine is a commissar currently attached to the 11th and Terry Rifles. One of the Imperial Guard regiments fighting to defend the worlds of the Bale Stars from a chaos cult called the Sighted. History Severa is the focus character of the short story Execution, as well as the novel Han or Bound, both written by Rachel Harrison. She was deployed with the 11th and Terry Rifles to the Bale Stars system to aid the Imperium's war effort in the system. When the regiment was ordered to attack an enemy fortress, the captain of the regiment refused saying it was a suicide mission. He apparently forgot that saying this out loud next to a commissar is another way of suicide. Rain blamed the captain and then had to calm down the regiment as she had just shot their commanding officer, who was apparently quite popular with the men. She stopped the regimental uprising by stating that the captain had refused the will of the emperor and that she was a commissar and shooting people who refused the emperor's will was her job. She then took command of the regiment and charged them into the fortress. 
where many of them died but they overcame the defenses and destroyed the fortress. She believes members of the regiment still hold a grudge, which considering she shot her beloved commanding officer in front of his troops and then forced them into a bayonet charge that only a Krieger would willingly commit to. This is probably an accurate assumption. Things got weird after that. The short version is, the Antari rifles started finding their sanctioned sickers getting confiscated, and when they asked why they were put on more suicide charges than usual, then Rain discovered that her sister, originally executed for heresy after a very public dishonorable discharge, was hit with trumped up charges all along, and the Lord General Militant of the Bale Stars was to blame. Turns out he was helping the sighted. Although, although she's not the only female commissar portrayed in black library fiction, she is the only one with a limited run. Admittedly never mind. As of the 10th of January 2023 GW announced they were turning her into a maid to order. Tabletop figure to her name. Commissar Yerick. Humies is all weak scum that deserved target stomped. Sept for one eye Yerick. He knows how to fight. Gazkal Magaruk Thracker alas. Poor Yerick. I knew him. Horatio. The unusually eloquent green skin Hamlet when thinking about his time on Armageddon the Fallen shall always be remembered as the Emperor's finest. Imperial Guard players after the new codex was released Sebastian Yerick is was one of the most baddest commissars ever to threaten inspire the Imperial Guard. He's probably dead now. Rip. The man. The myth. The legend. After his parents suddenly died, a young Sebastian was sent away from his comfortable life as the son of merchants to live with his only living relative, his grandfather, who had once served in the guard. His grandfather then ended up paying local bullies to beat the shit of a young Sebastian until his grandson finally asked for lessons on how to toughen up and survive. Sebastian learned quickly, and continued to learn even after the ruse had been blown. It's from here that his determination came to the fore. He wasn't even into his teens when orcs invaded his home world. His grandfather quickly went off to fight and Sebastian never saw him again. He then spent a large amount of time putting his lessons to good use, evading the orcs and even freeing some people who the orcs were keeping around for food. After being found by a guard contingent, he attracted the attention of the attached commissar who then had him sent to the scholar progenium. It was also at this point that he took on his grandfather's surname, Yerick. At that time he was on track to become an Imperial Guard Stormtrooper. He served in this role for several years after graduation, but eventually transferred to the Commissariat. He apprenticed under the respectable Lord Commissar Asp, becoming a full Commissar and having a long and distinguished career before retiring to Armageddon. Yerick's first name is also Sebastian, possibly inspired by the crab and the Little Mermaid in reference to his huge claw. He became an Imperium wide household name there, coming out of retirement to kick the teeth out of Gazgal Maguruk Thraka's wag. Gazgal thinks he's the bestest humor ever. He also has a laser eye, a la Superman, and an Xbox Oop power claw. Are we gonna talk about how he wields a storm bolter one handed when the only ones who can do that are superhumans clad in Terminator armor? Hell no. Why because Xbox Oop power claw? That's why. Also, because Yerick has only one hand is such a badass that he never needs to reload. Or has someone else reload his gun for him. He got his fuck huge power claw from an equally fuck huge orc who wanted Yerick to bend over while something horrible was done to said commissar. But Yerick proceeded to say fuck you filthy Zeno scum and kick the orc in the teeth with his commissar legs. He also had his arm chopped off in that fight but no one really cares because he stole the orc's arm with a free fuck huge power claw attached. He then gave himself the satisfaction of passing out like a boss the man is not only legend among men, but orcs as well. Should Yerik manage to finally kill Gazgaklor, it's only a matter of time before orcs start worshipping him, or at least naming him Gork and Mork's favorite, and our baddest warboss ever. Considering he can actually use his power claw and orc arm functionally means they consider him, at the very least, to be quite downright orky and all. And as we all know, what orcs believe becomes true. He also speaks orc. Yeah. It's not that hard. 
I mean, it's mostly just angry howls with the odd blow to the head for emphasis. It should be mentioned that since Orc Tech is faith powered, this makes Yerik the ultimate believer in his own abilities. Well, belief is belief after all. Yerik got his laser eye when he heard that the Orcs thought he had the gaze of death and could kill an Orc with a look. Yerik decided that if the Orcs thought he could kill with a look, then he was damn well going to be able to. Once again, what Orcs believe becomes true. He also never dies. Because of Iron Will dying is for pussies and heretics it doesn't hurt that the Orcs believe he can't die. So he really can't. He is an absolute monster of a combatant and can easily hand virtually any spes marine his ass on a ceramide platter in combat. Unless they have an invulnerable safe. Seriously the stats for old man Yerik are bullshit. Not even genetic enhancements and power armor are a match for an Xbox Oog power claw and fucking Superman style laser vision when paired with the standard issue balls of steel that every person in the Imperial Guard comes with Mars pattern adamantium testicles. He even fucking made a spes marine shut up with a single stare at him for yelling during Yerik's speech in Armageddon Third War. Yerik is currently chasing after Gazgul along with High Marshal Helbrecht at the head of a Black Templar crusade and the most amazing road trip ever. He also has his own personal banner blade called the Fortress of Arrogance. However it can only be taken an epoch. 7th edition made Yerik. Strange. He lost his fearless. Though it got replaced by a warlord tray, didn't gain stubborn every fucking other commissar gets and he gained summary execution despite the fact that his presence on the battlefield caused no soldier to run away. So yeah, unless Yerik is in charge, Yerik would rather run away than lead by example and fight say I'm too old for this shit and wander off to sit on the porch like the grouchy oldest retiree he technically is. WTFGW. WTF. He also had the stupid chain of command SR, meaning by default a company commander must be the warlord, not him. 8th edition returned Yerik to awesomeness. He's dropped the stupid chain of command rule and replaced preferred enemy. Orcs with a universal reroll 1s to hit for all squads within 6 inches of him. This becomes reroll all misses when fighting units with the orc keyword. He can still execute guardsmen from squads within 6 inches of him treaters as guardsmen themselves clubbing the only coward trying to run with the old man nearby to death with butts of last rifles. And he gives all Astra Militarum squads within 6 inches his awesome leadership of 9. Possible Steam Schmeddling and the book Imperial Creed. We get a possible explanation as to why Yerik cannot fall. During his first deployment as a commissar, Yerik had to deal with a chaos cult. Specifically at Siege 1, at the end of the conflict, Yerik is grabbed by a demon. Although Yerik held his faith and broke free, one has to wonder if this event changed Yerik. Maybe, maybe not. Then again, Siege is a dick. And it wouldn't be the first time Chaos has dicked around on Armageddon. Further evidence of Steamtian meddling is brought to light during the concluding chapter of Pyres of Armageddon. As Yarrick fights the Orc Warbus Eubel had, he feels the presence of the demon that he had fought on Mistral having some influence over the chain of events that led to Yarrick's defense of Hades Hive. What this demon has planned. If it has anything planned period, the Yerik has yet to be seen, although it's probably going to involve fighting Gazgul. Spooky stuff. AU Chaos Gits got it all wrong Yerik is the best Yumi ever, so we Orcs is using Darwirak to make sure he sticks around so we can have a roid proper scrap on as this man is basically an angry marine. If we listed all his awards, we'd need another page. However, at this point, he's probably worthy of a star of terror. Oil gas clear tar mesh and daddy got da award from me of being da best Yumi tar fight in da galaxy. Death, Yazwe god boy, real god, maybe even da best. He was da orkiest and fightiest Yumi in da galaxy GW. Keeping to its tradition of fucking over the guard has killed Yerik off in the new codex. And not even in a cool way, like having him die to gas or dying in bed with a belly full of wine and an orc's mouth around his cock, but gets unceremoniously killed off with a single lore excerpt from the newest codex. Expect the actual story to be sold in some overpriced warzone book, 
And now GW has addressed the rumors regarding Yerick in typical GW fashion by saying everything else but the actual answer. Well, the Imperium lies, and also keeps listing people as Kia. In the meantime, why don't you play Karen Creed instead it seems that for now, Yerick is officially dead until GW's greed prompts them to release a new model. Though unlikely since as of the 10th of January 2023 they announced his two old models would be turned made to order, satiating the beast for now, hopefully with new Armageddon Guardsmen, too. At least he lived long enough to be animated. Rumor says he actually got killed by Anglin him fucking self and his death is going to be set up for Gazi to give a legendary whooping to the returning demon Primark for stealing his kill. If he even did it. I mean why wouldn't Anglin have taken an Imperial hero's skull Gaz needs a new plaything regardless. May as well see if a good spanking can make those ass cheeks any redder.